This is the Hubblecast, news and images from the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope. Travelling through time and space with our host, Dr. J, a.k.a. Dr. Joe Liska. Welcome to this special episode of the Hubblecast, celebrating the International Year of Astronomy in 2009. 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei looked at the night sky through a telescope for the first time. So we have decided to produce a special series of podcasts about the telescope, this magnificent instrument that has changed our perception of the world around us. By taking our sense of sight far beyond the realm of our forebears' imagination, these wonderful instruments, the telescopes, open the way to a deeper and more perfect understanding of nature. For millennia, mankind gazed out into the mesmerizing night sky without recognizing the stars of our own Milky Way galaxy as other suns, or the billions of sister galaxies making up the rest of our universe, or that we are merely punctuation in the universe's 13.7 billion year long story. With only our eyes as observing tools, we had no means of finding solar systems around other stars or of determining whether life exists elsewhere in the universe. Today, we are well on our way to unravelling many of the universe's mysteries, living in what may be the most remarkable age of astronomical discovery. Four centuries ago, in 1609, a man walked out into the fields near his home. He pointed his homemade telescope at the moon, the planets and the stars. His name was Galileo Galilei. Astronomy would never be the same again. Today, 400 years after Galileo first pointed a telescope at the skies, astronomers use giant mirrors on remote mountaintops to survey the heavens. Radio telescopes collect faint chirps and whispers from outer space. Scientists have even launched telescopes into space, high above the disturbing effects of our atmosphere. And the view has been breathtaking. However, Galileo did not in fact invent the telescope. That credit goes to Hans Lipperhey, a slightly obscure Dutch-German spectacle maker. But Hans Lipperhey never used this telescope to look at the stars. Instead, he thought his new invention would mainly benefit seafarers and soldiers. Lipperhey came from Middelburg, then a large trading city in the fledgling Dutch Republic. In 1608, Lipperhey found that when viewing a distant object through a convex and a concave lens, the object would be magnified if the two lenses were placed at just the right distance from one another. The telescope was born. In September 1608, Lipperhey revealed his new invention to Prince Moritz of the Netherlands. He could not have chosen a more advantageous moment, because at that time the Netherlands were embroiled in the Eighty Years' War with Spain. The new spyglass could magnify objects, and so it could reveal enemy ships and troops that were too distant to be seen by the unaided eye. A very useful invention indeed. But the Dutch government never granted Lipperhey a patent for his telescope. The reason was that other merchants also claimed the invention, especially Lipperhey's competitor, Zacharias Janssen. The dispute was never resolved, and to this day, the true origins of the telescope remain shrouded in mystery. Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei, the father of modern physics, heard about the telescope and decided to build his own. About 10 months ago, a report reached my ears that a certain Fleming had constructed a spyglass by means of which visible objects, 
though very distant from the eye of the observer, were distinctly seen as if nearby. Galileo was the greatest scientist of his time. He was also a strong supporter of the new worldview advocated by Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus, who proposed that the Earth orbited the Sun instead of the other way round. Based on what he had heard of the Dutch telescope, Galileo constructed his own instruments. They were of a much better quality. Finally, sparing neither labour nor expense, I succeeded in constructing for myself so excellent an instrument that objects seen by means of it appeared nearly 1,000 times larger than when regarded with our natural vision. It was time to train his telescope on the heavens. I have been led to the opinion and conviction that the surface of the moon is not smooth, uniform and precisely spherical, as a great number of philosophers believe it to be, but is uneven, rough and full of cavities and prominences, being not unlike the face of the earth.